Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Shared Value Leadership Summit. We kindly ask you to make your way back to your seat as our program is about to continue. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, if you could kindly take your seats and turn your attention to the stage and welcome Jennifer Raju. So uh, where's the uh, clicker? Um, can I get a little? Hi, everyone. Just give me one second. I'm just going to grab the, uh, you guys have the clicker? Am I missing it? Tech? <laughs> huh? Do you know where the clicker is for the PowerPoint? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, we got it. Yeah, we got it. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Justin. Okay, cool. Okay, well, good morning. Good morning. So uh, thanks very much to the Shared Value Summit and uh, for being here. Uh, Michael Porter, your talk made me smile. Um, we are just beginning. So um, I'm here to tell you a story. Um, I'm with uh, Bridge International Academies. I'm the Vice President and Global Head of Insights and Strategy at Bridge. And Bridge, for those in the room that don't know, we're a social enterprise. So we're in the business of doing good. And what we do is we provide uh, great schools, primary schools, to families living on less than $2 a day per person around the world. We have over 500 schools around the world, mainly in Kenya, Uganda, uh, Nigeria, uh, India, growing in Liberia, increasingly working with a lot of governments. But that's not the story I'm here to tell you about today. What does it mean to create shared value? You know, especially when you're in the business of tackling social challenges and you're in the business of doing good. You know, it can be easy to assume that you are creating shared value with your customers or with the people that you work with or that you serve, right? How do you get that clarity as Dr. Porter talked about this morning, right? How do you, uh, how can you be sure that you're actually creating shared value? So take Bridge, we, are in the, we, we have great schools, right? We have technology in our schools, we have great teachers, uh, we're, we have sustained learning gains, we're making a difference. But we asked ourselves a few years ago, we looked, you know, that's, that's the work that my team does. We asked ourselves, how can we are, we, are we delivering value to our parents in the most meaningful way possible? How can we deepen the value that Bridge delivers to, to parents and, and improve their engagement with our schools? And how can we, you know, ultimately, you know, challenge some of the assumptions that we might have about our parents, right? We can't assume, and we always are asking that at Bridge. So what we did, this simple inquiry, actually led us on a quest of creating shared value. And this sent us on a journey which ultimately led us to identifying a very influential group of mothers. And here's my first spoiler alert. Those are those mothers. And, they, and with that, we built the Bridge Super Moms platform. And this platform, this is a women's empowerment platform. And you know, don't drown out with, when I say empowerment platform, uh, there's a little bit more to this story. Um, basically, this tapped into, this platform tapped, to and, tapped into and celebrated the powerful role that mothers are playing in the demand for learning and improved schools in low-income communities across Kenya. And in turn, by creating this platform, we have seen improved engagement in our schools improve loyalty with our schools, and improve champions for education, great education in the communities that we serve. So let me go forward. There we go. So let me tell you how we did this. We have to go back to 2015, August 2015, when I sent out research teams across Kenya. And the core of this was to get that clarity, right? Spend time with parents, learn from them. And we had a couple of assumptions going into this project, I'll be honest. One of them was we knew that women were interested in education. We knew that they were important to education. But what we kept hearing from our parents was that it was men that ultimately made the decisions, right, when it comes to the financial decisions in the home. And so, you know, we took a look at that. And actually what we found, and here's the next spoiler alert, they actually, we, we, we turned out to be, it turned out to be the other way around. Um, notably, we found that women are, the role of women are changing the communities that we serve and that they are increasingly driving decisions around education. But 
Interestingly, they were really driven to right the wrongs of their own development when they were growing up. We heard from a number of women that felt that expressed feelings of being robbed from educational opportunities when they were growing up, not being sent to school, being taken out too early. And this really has influenced their views on what parenting is today. And a good parent, what we found, is one who, what, understands and values a quality education, and number two, invests in it. Now, to give you a sense of this context, I have to go back to 2000 for a second. So where did this you know, changing norms come from? In 2000, the Millennium Development Goals create, were created, and they listed eight goals of which one was universal primary education. And this stimulated a lot of growth of primary schools across the developing world, right? Governments started building classrooms, expanding schools. It was great. It was getting more kids into classrooms. But the, here's the thing. They weren't learning in these classrooms. So there was this focus, this drive to bring the infrastructure. But once inside, the teachers weren't equipped. They were neglecting the students. You know, or the schools were lacking the fundamental materials that they needed to actually drive education learning outcomes, right? And here's the thing. The, you know, while we, this was, these stats are from 2015, but these parents in the mid-2000s, they knew that this was going on. These, they knew that these were not good schools. But their interest in education and their drive to get their kids into school was something that they started to want, right? There was something that really started to pick up. And what ended up happening was social entrepreneurs, Community leaders, educators started building non-formal uh, schools, private schools, that families living on less than $2 a day, as little as $1.25 a day, could go to. And parents responded in mass. There are now over 10,000 of these schools in Kenya, over 300,000 of these schools in India, over 20,000 of these schools, types of schools, in Lagos, Nigeria alone. So that's, that's the context that we work on. Now let's go back to our mothers. When we saw this, when we took that into account, we actually saw that these mothers were, their value of education and that, that experience of their own had really given them a fire to do differently for their own kids. And they were increasingly investing in, in, in influencing education decisions. And this wasn't really coming up so strongly in our surveys, and that's the important part of this story. We thought we had it right, but actually we were missing a really big component. And so what we saw is that these women were, you know, getting out and talking to women about shopping around, looking at different exams that were coming out at schools, really driving the conversation on quality education in their communities and influencing decisions in the home. You know, actually one of the key things that they were doing was starting to get the financial resources so that they could actually drive those decisions. So they would use things like uh, savings groups and you know, things that are called like merry-go-rounds where you know, every, every, every week women come to contribute a little bit of money and then someone takes the pot home every week. So they have you know, some substantial income to work with. And what we found through all of that work, what was actually happening is that these women you know, were actually on the hunt for three things, awareness, action, and connection. These are the big three themes that emerged from our our, our, our research. They were looking, actively seeking to build awareness around the financial resources within their community so that they could open doors. They were seeking access to markets so that they could actually engage in things like choosing a good school and getting their kids into a better school. And they were using and, and, and getting access to connection, connection with other women to empower themselves and to empower others. So they would come together in groups to get additional resources, to share information, to talk about what it means to be a good mother. So what do we do? We came back, we saw this big, huge, we finally could see it, right? We finally had that clarity. But what do we do? How do we actually meaningfully engage these awesome women? So, we created what we call the Bridge Supermamas platform. And we kicked this off in 2015, in December, with an inaugural conference that essentially brought women, 1,200 women from across Kenya, to do exactly what they wanted to do, to, to engage in conversations about education, to also connect and talk about, to build their awareness around opportunities in their communities, to 
build, to get access to you know, additional information around how to maybe grow or develop their business, to connect with other women and learn from them. And the very cool thing was, is that when we actually sent these women back, so we had a two-day conference. You'll see there on the bottom left is a wrapper. Uh, that was a Super Mamas wrapper that we created and gave to all the women. And we sent them back to their communities. And we didn't do much. We actually just gave them, you know, this was in 2016, gave them a few, you know, kind of ideas of what they could do. Uh, we gave them, you know, some tools to the, our principals and teachers to how to engage them. But we wanted to sit back and, and test this hypothesis. If we really focused on this influential group and gave them a platform that was meaningful to them and connected it to the school, what would happen? And what happened was, and I'll just take a few more minutes, what happened was, uh, a lot. We had super mama groups that were not only wearing and more proudly talking about the powerful role that they were playing in their communities and their families, but then they were also going out and partnering. We saw our value as a company actually improve greatly. They were going out and partnering with organizations like Medicine Sans Frontier and other uh, community-based organizations to bring things like health awareness into the schools. The top picture up there is a hand-washing program that came in. They also partnered with programs that could bring uh, other health programs. They did a program where they passed out sanitary napkins to girls. Uh, they went out and partnered with local leaders to bring local leaders into our schools so those local leaders could talk to our kids about reaching their dreams. And they did these things again and again. And more, more importantly, they were talking proudly about what it means to be this great parent, right? And, and, and the work that they were doing around uh, seeking financial resources, around accessing markets, around connecting with other women were now bounded, interwoven with our school. So here's the cool thing. So we're 2018, this has been going on, we've been observing. And last year, we started hearing from the men, the fathers, the papas. What about us? Can't we have a super papa group? Me too. We're involved in this too. It's about us, right? We are developing our societies together. We are developing our communities together. And now we've empowered these women and celebrated this super parent um, idea. And so what we're doing this year is we're actually piloting some super papa groups. And we're also working on improving. We've been doing additional research in our other markets in India, Nigeria, to see if this super mama platform could actually be expanded, and it can, and it will. Here's my call to action to you. We're talking about shared value, right? And we talked about the beginning of the today, the clarity that we're all looking for that is needed, right? My call to action to you is do what we did. Ask yourselves, if even if you're in the business of doing good, uh, you know, before you just start throwing things at the wall, right? What do we know about our customers? What would be meaningful? Do we know? What are our assumptions? And then go out and figure that out. And it might surprise you. You may up and end up having a super mama group like us. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, now I have the great pleasure to introduce and bring back Professor Michael Porter in dialogue uh, with the president and CEO of Humana, Bruce Broussard. Uh, just a quick word on this upcoming session. I mean, needless to say, the provision of healthcare represents a major part of the overall economy in the United States and other countries around the world. So it's a, just a critical issue. But of course, what's always been fascinating to me from a shared value perspective uh, in particular uh, with Humana's business and in the insurance business is the health of their customers is exactly and inextricably aligned with the interests of their business. And in fact, of course, uh, nothing could be better for their business than for, for their customers to be healthy and to engage uh, in practices that extend their life and extend their health. Bruce has been the CEO of Humana since 2011 and previously held a CEO position in McKesson's specialty U.S. oncology business. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Bruce Broussard and Michael Porter. Thank you. Thanks, Chelsea. 
So we need high, higher seats here, huh, Mike? Well, I do because of my slightly damaged uh, right uh, hip joint here. Yeah. But um, unfortunately, you're you're suffering by that. Uh, but hopefully, it's cool to be yes, up on a, exactly. on a nice high seat, isn't it? Great. Pretty hip up here. Yeah, pretty hip. Pretty hip. Very good. This guy's a health guy. You can tell. So uh, I want to uh, thank Jennifer for a terrific uh, talk, which uh, uh, brings brings a lot of, of powerful you know insight into what shared value is all about. Uh, and and I personally have been involved in 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 another similar organization called Innova Schools in Peru, which really was inspired by Bridge. There's an HBS case on Bridge. There's now an HBS case on Innova and. Um, Innova has many of the same fundamental principles, but I, I just think just just to accent a little bit what you just heard, um, what Bridge did and what this Innova schools are doing, they are private sector for-profit initiatives, um, and that's the only way they could have scaled. <laughs> um, and they're they're creating enough value in terms of the outcomes they're getting for their their students that. The families are willing to are willing to pay, um, and um, what's really important for us all to understand is government could not have done it. Government was too tied up in politics, too tied up in unions, too tied up in all kinds of obstacles to actually really fixing the schools. It would be great if government could have better schools, but it took the private sector, it took the shared value model to achieve this extraordinary. Uh, impact that these organizations are having, and I, I, I hope that this uh, Peruvian uh, Innova Schools uh, group is going to have the same effect in Latin America now crossing countries and working in my, multiple countries than, than Bridge did. So, uh, Jennifer, that uh, terrific session, and, and thank you. Um, we have a real privilege today to have Bruce Broussard uh, with us, and uh, Bruce is the CEO of Humana. He's had a distinguished history and in, in the healthcare field. Uh, he now leads one of the major uh, uh, for-profit uh, health insurance companies, private health insurance companies, revenues of roughly 50 billion. So this is a big company. Um, and um, uh, Humana has um, embarked uh, on a path that I think uh, is not uh, a natural one for their industry. Um, and uh, Justin mentioned earlier that what more important for a health insurance company than health? But yet the business models of health insurance companies, private health insurance companies, have not been fundamentally about health. They've been about providing services. They've been about, uh, and in fact the traditional business model was that the, the insurance company got a markup on whatever the health costs were. And of course, what's your incentive if you get a markup on what the health spending is? Uh, uh, well, it's not so great. But something remarkable is happening and started happening a number of years ago at Humana, and that is, uh, under Bruce's leadership, this health... Uh, plan, this health insurance company, embarked on a fundamental transformation of the way it thought about its business and its business model. And I think it's really a classic example of, of what shared value is all about. But let me tell you, it's not easy. It wasn't a, oh yeah, let's do it, we're done. Uh, it's been a journey, uh, and Bruce has been uh, leading that journey, uh, you know, for uh, all this this number of years. Uh, and there's been a few distracting things, like an Aetna potential acquisition, another thing, uh, an, an announcement about Walmart, maybe, you know, taking them over or something. But all, through all this uh, turmoil and complexity, uh, here's a company that's been pursuing a fundamental, uh, transformative shift in strategy and shift in business model. So. Bruce, uh, we're so pleased to have you here. Uh, this, is, this initiative and this effort and this transformation is called the Bold Goal, G-O-A-L, the Bold Goal. Uh, so Bruce, could you uh, tell us what is the Bold Goal? What's the core idea here? Uh, you know, uh, you know how, how does this work? Yeah, um, well first, thanks for all you're doing. 
Um, oh, for, this is, thank this you. is wonderful stuff here. Nothing compared uh, to you. Uh, the, um, so our bold goal, I'll just sort of state what it is, is it's to improve the communities we've served's health by 20% by 2020 through making it easier for people to achieve their best health. We set this in motion in 2014, so it's been a number of years. But most importantly, what we did is, is we also decided to measure it, hold ourselves accountable. And if you were to go to our website, you would see that we publish every year our progression in our communities that we serve, um, how we've improved their health. And we, and we really did a lot of research and came to the conclusion that the measurement of healthy days, and healthy days is four simple questions that you ask our members, our employees, we refer to them as teammates and associates, about their health. And that it's a CDC measurement. CDC has been doing this for a number of years. And it's really, how do you feel about your mental health and physical health? And it seems so simple, but it has created so many different um, leverage points for us as an organization, both in learning, but also setting the direction of the organization. It's, been, it's just been a wonderful evolution of us. And, and what creates the business model here yeah. for you? Yeah, so if you think about the statement I made, it, it really has two parts to it. Health outcomes is the first part, improve, improving the communities we serve. And the second part is simplicity of healthcare. And if you think about healthcare, healthcare has two problems to it. It's complex as hell. And the second thing is, is that people are driven to treatment versus health outcomes. And it's really that measurement that we are oriented to and that that sort of has set us uh, uh, to, to a direction that has allowed us to begin to start making some, some investments that uh, I don't think we would have made without that kind of perspective. Yeah. So, so basically, you know, as, as I think Justin said, I mean, if you can allow people to be healthier, they're gonna, there's going to be less health cost. Right. Okay? So it seems kind of obvious, but yet it's hard mm -hmm. to think this way, and it's not been the way the industry thinks. So... How, how did this, how did you get this idea? How did this yeah. emerge? Where yeah. did it come from? So, you know. So I was on the job for about a week and uh, we had this town hall meeting and, and someone came up to me and asked me a question. They asked, are we in the Medicare business or are we in the wellness business? And I sort of s sat and thought about that and said, wow, that's an interesting question. Those are not mutually exclusive businesses. And that sort of set me on this road is, is that we're not aligned in thinking about what we are, our purpose, our strategy, our tactics, and our measurement. And as in this, this for me, alignment was a really important part of how do you align from really what you state you're about to your actions to your measurements. Mm -hmm. And to me, it was that statement that then I went out and said, we're going to figure this out about how do we create this alignment. So I took one of our top leaders and dedicated her for almost nine months to figure out how do we create this alignment and how do we create this measurement because I want both to be part of that and that's how it came about. Hmm. Interesting. And, and, and what was the dialogue within the team as, as you were uh, doing this? A little bit it was, oh, this is just a fad that will pass. Yeah. So that we'll was, wait him out. He'll, exactly, he'll exactly. Yeah. He's only been here a week, and we've been here for 20 or 30 years, and we'll, we'll just sort of, we'll just, this too will pass. And mm -hmm. so there's a little bit of that, and a little bit of skepticism, and a little bit of, well, this is just the soft stuff. Mm -hmm. But um, over the years, they've known that I haven't and will not give up on it. Um, and so there was sort of this movement that's happened that's begun to become just such an important part of the organization that it really defines who we are. And there's been so many benefits from it that people say, you know, that really works. Mm -hmm. It really works. In fact, I think um, in Davos, you had our CFO on a panel. I did. And um, Brian was an advocate of it. And this is mm -hmm. a guy that came out of Goldman. He's, you know, he's a... Uh, oh, uh, Goldman. And he's a big investment banker. And, <laughs> and this is a guy that is just really, really excited about this. Yeah. Well, look, I, I, I've met a number of people on your team at this point, and, and I, I'd say everybody's really excited about mm -hmm. it, you know, because it feels like this is, this is a good reason to be doing business uh, as a health plan, and this is something worth doing. And uh, so, so tell us a little bit about the mechanics of, of, of how this works. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, your measurement, your, the kind of uh, steps that you're taking that you didn't used to take as a 
health plan to kind of drive change in this area. Yeah, a few things there. First, uh, the measurement was a really important part of the Healthy Days, and just the Healthy Days itself has given us a, uh, an opportunity to see our progression, <laughs> but it's given us a platform to learn. Just to give you an example, and in our associate base, we've done we've had a lot of improvement in in their health, and it's been able to. Uh, we we found that in earlier part of your career, your mental health is actually worse than your physical health when you compare it relative to other populations. And it's because of the stresses and strains that a younger career has around, you probably are just having children, you're trying to learn your career, you probably have dual incomes, and so that your day-to-day -day life is really complex. So for us as an organization, our HR department said, you know what, we have to help them with their stress in their daily life. And so they began to start focusing on how do we reduce stress. And we have this thing in the company called inherent stress and added stress. Inherent stress is if you're a nurse, you have inherent stress in your job as a result of the things that are happening on a day-to-day -day basis. But if there's added stress, the system is complicated that you're using, or if you're, you know, your, your uh, leader is, is not a, a great leader, we then began to start saying, how can we remove that that stress out of their life. Mm -hmm. In addition, financial stability and those kind of things become a part of that. But that mm -hmm. wouldn't have happened if we didn't understand that mental health. And, yeah. and, 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 and that cascaded down from the kind of overall outcome measure right. you selected as something clear and recognizable and understandable to everybody is the healthy days concept, right. uh, which then could be dis, you know, kind of broken up into the component parts and the mental health part was a surprise. By the way, it, I think it's, it, I know, but just make sure everybody knows, the, the, Humana does the same thing for both its subscribers and for its associates, right. okay? So it, it's kind of doing the, the same strategy for the internal people and as well as the external clients. And um, um, which I think is in incredibly important because what we've learned is that it's not that employees uh, uh, are always that healthy and, uh, and the cost of poor health among your employees is really, really high. So here's a strategy that works for both the outside customer but also the internal associate. Yeah. Just on the outside customer real quick, um, the, we also began to start looking at how do we engage the communities in mm -hmm. that. And, uh, and the community engagement was something that we realized for us to impact someone's health, you also have to impact their lifestyle. And you have to impact the healthcare system. And so we engaged and we had, a, had a, our market leaders along with some, some individuals, Patty Dale being, being the leader part of that, took that on to say, how do we engage in the communities? And we, be, we began to construct customized programs based on the needs of those communities mm -hmm. to be able to bring alive how we can help them. And, mm -hmm. and that helped us from a business point of view, but it also helped the community yeah. in being able to advance Give it. us some examples of what sort of things. Well, San Antonio was a big one. In, in San Antonio, diabetes is a, is a large um, part of the contributor to the healthcare cost. And, and we began to start to understand diabetes. We, under, we understood, in fact, that uh, within the diabetes area, food access was a really important part of that. It was easy to get junk food. It was easy to get and it was reasonably priced. And so we partnered with a grocery store in that area, HEB, to really offer healthy foods at a fast, uh, to be able to turn it around quickly. And that was an example where the community came and said, okay, we are going to commit to helping lower diabetes in our community. Humana said we are actively part of that, and so how can we help? And today, uh, we are you know working on partnership with them. In fact, we have a uh, these things called guidance centers, and they're right next to HEB, and we have culinary classes that people walk around the the um, um, grocery store, getting understanding where to get healthy foods and how to shop for them and how to do it in an economic way. But that's just a small example of engaging in a specific area that affected a condition that we saw that was very um, uh, important to that community. Mm -hmm. Good, okay. So um, talk a little bit about how you're doing. Um, you know, uh, shared value is about a business model. Mm -hmm. It's about, uh, you know, driving a, greater long-term profitability, you know, how, how's this playing itself out in terms of your, uh, your, your, your cost model and, and your, uh, uh, the economics of the business? Yeah. A few things there. 
Um, first, I mean, if you look at our earnings growth and, and the trajectory, I think in 14 we did about $7 earnings per share. This year we'll do close to $14 earnings per share, so you've seen significant growth. Stock in, in that period of time around 13, 14 was in the 60 to 90 dollar range today. It's in the 295 dollar range, so you've seen significant growth there. Um, but more Buy on shared value. <laughs> True, literally. But, but more importantly, and, and those are good indicators, and you know our shareholders have been rewarded. Our associate engagement scores are at the 90 percentile. Our net promoter score has increased by about 600 basis points. Our um, our um, clinical outcomes have improved in a number of different uh, clinical areas. There, so it's not only about uh, shareholders. But it's about the, and our brand has gone up significantly, the, the relevancy of our brand. It's, it's been this multi-dimensional benefit mm -hmm. that has happened in that, in that. And you mentioned mm -hmm. a little bit about the, the Aetna transaction. So for many of you, if you don't know, we were tied up with a transaction that ultimately got rejected by the Justice Department for about two years. And during that period of time, our engagement scores stayed at about the 90 percentile. Mm -hmm. And if you were to ask the associates why, it was because of the purpose of the company, but defined purpose of the company. Mm -hmm. they, they understood it, they saw us measuring it, they saw us publishing how we were doing it, and it was an active part of our conversations in the, in the organization with our values being the how we do it. Mm -hmm. And, and what, what are, how's, how's the Healthy Days numbers looked over time? Depends well, on the what, community, um, yeah. but we are um, in, in more mature communities like San Antonio, we are on our, our, our means to meet our goal, the 20% improvement. Mm -hmm. Within our associate community, we set that goal to be in, in a, by 2018, and we will achieve that, that goal. Uh, some of the younger communities that have not been there, they're still progressing, but they're probably going to uh, miss the 2020 goal. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Healthy Days has been ratcheting uh, mm -hmm. in the positive direction. Direction, yeah. more healthy days right. um, and when you say younger communities what do you mean uh, one of the maturity of us bringing the bold go I see. Out, engaging with the community so they, they the weren't in the first tier the, the of cohort so to speak the cohort yeah. of, of, of communities yeah. okay. San Antonio is the the most advanced and that 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 community really has shown year by year improvement in, mm -hmm. in healthy days yeah. our hometown um, Louisville Kentucky uh, was later added and, and you and you see them improving but not at the rate that mm -hmm. you would see others and and the the general plan is to roll this out to all the communities yeah we have this definition called a bold uh, bold goal and then we assign a leader to that marketplace to be sort of the conductor of the market and, and ensuring we're progressing going forward and as we see a market ready to do it because it does require um, commitment from all it requires mm -hmm. commitment from the leader in the marketplace requires commitment of um, of the community itself. And so we don't want to just sort of kick something off to, to mm -hmm. uh, kick it off. We really look to the commitment of it. One of the things we also did, and I've, I failed to mention this, was we also aligned our charitable work with this work. And so what we've done with our associates, we have about 50,000 associates. We uh, give them paid time off for their charitable work, but we aligned it to charitable organizations that contribute to the healthy um, days and that. So we've, we've, we've aligned that. We have a foundation, the Humana Foundation, and the funding from the Humana Foundation is to help with social determinants. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the things are, we have a, a team of people that research healthy days and impact of it. One of the things we found was social is isolation, loneliness, and food access for seniors was a very large impact mm -hmm. on healthy days. Yeah. Um, in fact, each one has about a one day impact a month. And so our foundation and our charitable organization, our charitable uh, work is all wrapped around how do we get help people with loneliness and food access mm -hmm. um, yeah. and, and be able to support that in the communities. Yeah, and just again, to be a professor again, FSG Doctrine says you align your philanthropy with your shared value strategy. And then you get a multiplicative effect. And I, th I think Humana has, has done that in spades. That was very, very clear, uh, Bruce. We didn't read it. We tripped over it. So. You tripped? Now look. <laughs> you, 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 you've, you invented it, probably. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, we, we, we just, we just learned from, from you guys. A, what a bit of common sense. So, so um, the, I'm glad you brought up the philanthropy point and the, and the mm -hmm. volunteering point. 
Um, what other kinds of, let's call it interventions, um, are you guys doing as a health plan that most health plans wouldn't do, given this strategy? Yeah. I think, I think one of the things that we have become really appreciative about is disease progression. Mm -hmm. And disease progression is over a period of time. So if you are an individual that has a uh, mild case of diabetes, without the right interventions, you will progress naturally, uh, sometimes faster than others, depending on your, on your, on your condition, to um, mild and severe. I mean, just to give you the business case of this, an individual that has um, uh, early stage diabetes will cost us about $800 a month on, on uh uh, and, and total health care costs. If you get to severe, it's about $4,500. And all, the difference between uh, um, early stage diabetes and late stage diabetes is all around lifestyle and prevention. Mm -hmm. And having these interventions that help people on their lifestyle, and you think, well, we're a health care company and we're only going to worry about health care. In reality, we are a health care company that is in, greatly influenced by lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And being able to start to have that interception is really important. And we would not have had that if we had the short-term view of ROI every, every month on how do we stop admissions this month on, on hospitals. Mm -hmm. As opposed to having this longer view of, you know what, how do you help people stay healthy? And there's a disease progression curve. And how do we intervene on those, on those particular areas that make an influence on that? Yeah, I mean, just for everybody's benefit, I mean, the industry, uh, Bruce's industry has been really riveted on kind of how do I keep down costs, control costs, avoid any cost I can avoid because that's the, that's the route to profitability and success and this is a very different model. It says, boy, if I can stop disease progression, that's a big deal for profitability. And, um, and, and so the question is, how do you get your, your team, your associates to understand that? And, yeah. and how do you retrain people who've grown up in an industry that was really, uh, I mean, there was a, in, in healthcare, uh, health plans, I mean, I, everybody here knows this, but there's a, you know, they go, there's all this claims denial process. You know, people want to have some help and then they call in and then it gets denied. And maybe sometimes it should be denied. But again, that mindset is completely different than yeah. what your program is yeah. all about. And one, one of the things that this idea of disease progression and, and is then it started asking, well, you need to keep uh, our customer for a longer period of time. Because A, you want to have an impact over a period of time, but you want to get rewarded for that. Mm -hmm. So then that got into the conversation about retention. Then that got into a conversation about customer experience which then got into a conversation about net promoter score, mm -hmm. that that got into a conversation about call transfers mm -hmm. and other things. And it just began to start changing the way we looked at the business model from just a business model about financial affairs to now quality and experience is a really important part of what we do. Mm -hmm. And in fact, this year we just rolled out a, for our, uh, we have about, as I mentioned, about 50,000 employees, about 28,000 are our bonus now. Part of their bonus is net promoter score. Um, and it's just an example where this peeling back of the onion of what makes an impact, you begin to start changing what's important to you as, a, mm -hmm. as an organization. Yeah. Mm -hmm. all, all then, you know, kind of being driven by this uh, shared value core mm -hmm. positioning that, that you had adopted. So um, uh, could we just talk about the kind of rollout of this and the internal issues that arose in the process? So. How did you bring the organization along? How did you get people to uh, you really change what they were thinking about doing and, and even doing in many yeah. cases? Well, <clears throat> a dedicated team was really important in that. And you know, I, I mentioned Patty Dale and team. Uh, they sort of led the charge. And so first, the dedication of a team that mm -hmm. helps with this. And then picking a few markets that you can do this in. And we had an, a number of markets that raised their hand that says, I want to be part of this. And, mm -hmm. and we began to start breaking down the silos in the markets between one business and another, and they began to start operating the same. And they created a council, and that council then engaged with the community, and, and that sort of began that. Yeah. Um, then, you know, we dedicated a research team to it. Um, to go and research what are the important uh, lever points in healthy days, and we began to look at conditions and, as I mentioned, social determinants and so on. Um, but 
that then just started peeling back what we needed to do. Mm -hmm. um, I would say persistency, as I, if you were to come to my office, I have this box that sits on top of my, uh, one of my shelves and it has the four Ps. One is passion, mm -hmm. one is persistency, one is patience, and the other is Pepmobismo. And, the, <laughs> and, and those four Ps were really important to be able to, uh, to pursue through these times when you sit through a meeting and you hear a leader say, well, there, there's no ROI on that, and why are we investing in that? Because we can't get an ROI for two years versus six months. And, mm -hmm. um, and so there is some pushing, but it really began to become infected in the organization, and then that sort of, and we get some wins, and then those wins are reinvested in other markets and, yeah. and so on. Go a little bit further into that. Who were the resistors? What did they resist? Yeah, you know, there's there's people that uh, in our organization, like every organization, and I'm paid for the short term as well as the long term, um, and so they are very oriented to their budget. They're very oriented to you know they have to report to somebody that has to you know report to somebody that then reports to the shareholders. And there's this that resistance isn't about the passion and the right thing to do. It's about the urgency that they have to deliver something and that and that yeah. that is just a natural. Tension, and I call it a healthy tension because you can't have a long term without a short term. Um, but but that tension needs to put it, be put in context to a broader uh, visibility, and that that's sort of where was the pushback. And that mm -hmm. is, so, as the operator at the market that says, "I got a budget to make," um, you know, it's the the finance department says we got to report these kind of earnings and and that pressure there, and mm -hmm. you have to sort of deal with it because mm -hmm. you, that's an important part of keeping the company disciplined and mm -hmm. and organized and oriented to the right things. But you have to be pushing back and saying, now how do we do that and do this? Because those are not mutually exclusive. So let me ask one more question, then we'll open it up. Mm -hmm. uh, and by the way, I'm going to be on time, for sure, 100% on time. Justin, where are you? Um, so um, in developing and building out this strategy um, around Healthy Days and, and all the associated activities you talked about, talk about the partners and the other entities that you had to work with that you'd really never had to work with before as a health plan. Yeah, yeah. a few things. First, bringing the associates into this was really helpful, both in us uh, reaching out and caring for their health, because we're measuring their healthy days. That was a community we defined. And, and that gave an, an expression of our interest in their life and all the things there. So that was, a, that was an important community. But then we extended the community to providers and brought providers on. And they were saying, wow, you, wanna, you, wanna, you want us to help improve the community? And you're going to have a vested interest in that. And so it wasn't just about a negotiation of a contract. It was about how do we, how do we help the community. And then uh, we brought in um, nonprofit organizations that would, could help in advancement of that. So there was a, a group of nonprofit organizations that would be brought along, governmental um, organizations, whether it was city or state, depending on the marketplace, um, that would, would uh, help us and, and some of their agencies that would be in there. So it was a holistic view that allowed us to really engage in areas you wouldn't normally engage with. I mean, a number of organizations that deliver food, we would have never engaged with them unless we wrote them a check, but this had a really specific purpose. Food access is really important for seniors, mm -hmm. and this is important for our seniors, so how can we get the food to them in the appropriate period of time? Okay, well, there's, some, there's been some great questions. I've actually uh, used a couple of them already, but let me just... Uh, um, uh, uh, there's a question, who was the greatest champion and the greatest detractor of the Bull Gold strategy among the people in your leadership team? I don't know if there was ever, a, um, I, I wouldn't say there was a detractor. I would say there probably wasn't a passionate support. Let me say it that mm -hmm. way. And I understand I'm playing <laughs> with words here, so I got that. <laughs> I'm not a very good politician. Um, but um, I would say that the areas that were had to deliver financial results were the ones that were most um, challenged with it because it was soft, it was long term, it required investments, it required change in metrics outside of just the, the financial metrics. But over time, 
they evolved. I, I, I'll tell you one of the most impactful things I, 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 I did is I, I created this sense of responsibility. And I, I said, you know, we were, and this was in a meeting one day, <clears throat> we were fortunate to be brought to this company, however you got here, whether you got here when you got out of college and, and came to the, you know, the, uh, grew through the ranks of the company or you came outside. And the people before us that were running this company made some really good decisions that allowed us to be able to be in the position where we are where we have a brand, we can recruit talent, we have, you know, we have the financial reputation in the industry to, rec to be able to raise capital, we have a customer value proposition, we have a, an ability for customers to come to us and we have a, an ability to, an operating model to solve. And I said, our responsibility is to leave the company a better place than we came and to be able to, for the next generation to have. And when you begin to start to talk like that, in addition, you gotta have 15% earnings per share growth and all that, that other stuff. They begin to start to say, ah, it's not either or. It's mutually connected and our job as leaders is to do both, not to do one. So uh, there's a question, do you expect to meet your bowl goal by 2020? Uh, how have you, how you been trending? You covered yeah. that a little bit, but maybe a little bit yeah, more. Yeah, a few things there. It will be community by community. Um, so yeah. we don't have a, because of the way the communities are, we don't have a, overall company, it's a, a community, um, and, and but most of our communities, as I mentioned, we will achieve that bold goal. Mm -hmm. The uh, associate uh, one we've already achieved, and the other ones we will, we will be close to or at uh, meet. As I mentioned, there's a few that are in, in sort of the teeter-totter land. Yep. And uh, the ones that are not looking good to achieve, what, what's caused that? Um, some of it is community engagement. Some of it is, uh, I would say, uh, the passion of the community itself um, is, is probably the biggest, the biggest and, and, thing. And tell us, give us a little texture of that. Um, and, and finding, you know, this is all, you don't have to name the community. No, I won't. I don't. This but is all, but finding know. an HEB partner yep. is impactful. Yep. And if you can't find an HEB partner that they too have the commitment and purpose then you, you sort of got one, one oar in the, in, in the water and you're rowing, you know, and you're not gonna get there as, as mm -hmm. quickly. And I, I think getting partners that are committed to it in a, in a, in a, in a direct way and the passion behind mm -hmm. it. In, in is, each of these in areas. In these communities. So yeah. it's no different than a, you know, a management team and anything else. If, if, if everyone's not running in the same direction, it's really hard to mm -hmm. play the game and know the play you're playing. So. <laughs> How's government reacted to this? Which governments have been, you know, on 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 the bus? Which governments have not gotten it? Yeah. How, how would you talk I about? I would the say the government? cities that are really oriented to having a healthy um, um, environment is is the ones that have gotten not at the the most. Uh, mm -hmm. The states are there, but they're dealing with broader issues. Uh, you know, we're Medicaid. Uh, provider and, um, and and in that area we probably have been able to to help out a little bit, but surprising or not, which we have been really um, happy with, and just recently, Medicare is starting to move to these social determinants, and I think mm -hmm. a lot of the work that we've done in research and a lot of the work that we've done in 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 educating them has assisted the federal government in deciding, you know what, it's just not about health care. Mm -hmm. Lifestyle, and especially in under-resourced areas where they don't have access to transportation, so they're locked up in their homes, where they don't have access to their to to food, or they don't know how to shop or or cook, um, it becomes a, a much different conversation. And so, what we're seeing is this movement that social determinants is an important part of healthcare, yeah. and, which is is really. I think rising in the field as a whole, but what's fascinating and exciting here is that you're actually doing something about it. Right. Uh, whereas a hospital system is in a very different position to, uh, to do as, as much as you do. Um, well, we just have uh, just a few seconds left. Um, what advice would you offer everybody sitting in this room about you know, how to think about and, and then make happen this kind of transformation yeah. in you know, their company. Well, first, <clears throat> it's the persistency. I mean, it's, you, gotta, you just got to, you got to, you got to push through because, um, as I said, people are waiting for it to be the fad that gets washed away and that. 
the second is I found the biggest impact for us was not only the defining of it, but the, the measurement of it. And the more you can measure the preciseness of it, it's really important. We had a, we had a, it's our dream and others would call it a mission, but lifelong well-being. But you could drive a truck through lifelong well-being. It's when we refined it and then put in a, a, a measurement next to it, it became much more tangible. It, mm -hmm. was, it was not abstract there. So that was, that was another area there. Find places you can win. You don't boil the ocean. Find some passionate people that want to carry it on that will also be the, your evangelist and going through. And then be able to then get some wins. Um, and then once you get some wins, I think you'll, you'll be able to show it. But always keep the business purpose in mind. If you sort of do it on the side and it's not aligned to your business purpose, then you have, you're not aligned and you have two, two, two things that are going to get diluted. Your business purpose is going to get diluted and your purpose that you've mm -hmm. defined is going to get diluted. So the more you can dev develop that alignment. Well, what an amazing example of what we are talking about here, uh, of the shared Varia concept and, and the, the kind of nuance and innovation that, that Bruce and his team have applied to kind of make this happen. We're going to, it's going to be really stunning to watch this take off. I mean, this, this hopefully will change the health plan industry. This will be so compelling that a health plan that doesn't do this will get dropped by whoever's, whoever's hired them. And, uh, and I, I see it also starting to permeate the health delivery systems uh, that are sort of encouraged and emboldened by this effort to take more responsibility of their own for this kind of activity. So congratulations, Ruth. Phenomenal, stunning, and uh, we're so pleased to have you here. Thank well, you. Thank you, and thank you for the work you do. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. You're fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce, and thank you, Michael. You know, at 1.30, I'm really looking forward to the session we have, and in fact, it, it continues on with this theme. It's the future of artificial intelligence and healthcare featuring Deb DeSanzo, the general manager of IBM Watson Health, and one of my colleagues, Lauren Smith, who's managing director at FSG, and um, who actually is appropriately called Dr. Lauren Smith. She's a practicing, or has been a practicing pediatrician. So we'll carry on this conversation of how do we bring AI into healthcare, uh, building on what Bruce and Michael have talked about in the insurance business. Before we get to that, we're gonna break for lunch. So if you could join me back for that session right at 1.30, I'd very much appreciate it. Enjoy your lunch. <laughs>